And in that moment, I said that, again, an atheist didn't believe, the audible voice of God. We're not talking about a small voice. We're not talking about an inward. The audible voice of God from heaven said, Isaiah, I don't want 99.9% .9 of you. I want everything. If you have heard of Isaiah Saldivar, it's very likely it's because of his connection to the Demon Slayers, Deliverance Ministry, and his very fiery brand of charismatic preaching. Have this generation, we are gonna stand against the powers and the principalities and the rulers of this world. In fact, he came on the scene in 2022, most people, because of his YouTube channel and the topics he covers on there that most people don't talk about at all. And if you haven't heard of him, that's probably why. Isaiah belongs to what to I would broadcast. classify as a new sort of section of internet influencing pastors that really didn't necessarily start on the internet, but begin to get a lot of traction and influence and followers around the 2020 shutdown. Watch your videos every day in my living room. Like we're going directly now into people's living rooms, into people's homes and preaching the most powerful message in human history. And we will at the end of the video get into the more controversial things that he said and the controversial things about his ministry. But it's important to know before we get there that his ministry actually started a decade decade ago in his parents' living room in California. Isaiah was born to a Janelle and Nick Saldivar. In fact, his entire name is Isaiah Luke Saldivar. And Isaiah was born on March 12, 1988 into an Italian slash Spanish family. He was the third of four children. Well, what's your siblings' names? So Nico's the oldest, then Sunshine, then Isaiah, then Cherish. And then and we have an adopted names. younger sister, Juliana. Isaiah was a church kid. He grew up in church, but he would classify it as not a spirit filled church. Never understood when I was in the world as an atheist, people thought I'd just come to church and I'd go to church and I'd always be like, it's so boring. Nobody's excited. By the time he had finished homeschooling at 16, he was really sort of done with church altogether. He and a friend of mine, we all went to church and I'll never forget. So I'm about to walk in the church and I tell myself this in my head. I say, this will be the last time I ever step foot in church, right? This is three wow. years of not going to church. And I've been raised in church. I went to all the vacation Bible schools, all the mm -hmm. purity conferences, my whole life in church. And then here I am now, years not going. And I said to myself, before walking through the door of the church in Modesto, California, mm -hmm. uh, Calvary Temple, now it's called the house. I said, I'll never step foot in the door of a church again. This will be the last night I ever step foot in a church again. Isaiah's entire goal in life was to go to college and major in the criminal justice field to become a police officer. He had a girlfriend at the time that he planned on marrying, and he thought his entire life was on track, working at Starbucks with his sister Cherish as he went to college to become a police officer, spending much of his free time playing in a metal band called Ourselves Among Others. Have you ever thought about using your rock singing voice to worship the Lord? I didn't sing, I played drums. What metal band were you in? Uh, it was called Ourselves Among Others. We still have some music up on MySpace, ser seriously, and I think SoundCloud. All of this began to change, however, without Isaiah actually knowing it when his sister Cherish invited him to church. And so my sister for about six months is bugging me to go to church. Isaiah, you got to go to church. Isaiah, you got to go to church. This church that I'm inviting you to, you're going to feel God. You're going to experience God. I thought she was crazy because I never understood that God could be felt. God could be experienced. I just thought God was some religious thing that you just pray to and does nothing. I thought, you know, when you're weak, you go to church. You know, to me, Christians, they dressed funny. They smelled weird. And I didn't really want nothing to do with God and so I was just like no I don't want to go so for about I don't know four now I'll use some uh, vagueness as much as I can because I don't want to exaggerate I don't want to lie so it was probably four to six months I don't want to say an exact time but it was probably four between four and six months my sister begged me Isaiah just go to church go to church and I'm like there's no chance there's no chance Isaiah Saldivar is going to go to church my mind was this what do I need from God in fact, she bugged him so much, he eventually convinced his girlfriend to just go one time with him to satisfy his sister's request. So on January 12th, 2011, Isaiah takes the 25-minute car ride to Calvary Temple, now called The House, in Modesto, California. So I just feel honored that I was able to even be a part of your story, let alone mm. be the one that took you to church. But there were so many laborers for you, like yes. mom, dad, grandma, Nino, Nina, like all these people that have been praying for him since he was born. And I got to do the fun part of like bringing you, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that night completely changed Isaiah's life. 
Isaiah recounts that while he was sitting there during the worship set, he was actually making sexual jokes about the youth pastor's wife, which happened to be the one singing on stage. Even in the message, Isaiah wasn't paying a lot of attention at all. He knew it was about world missions and going out, but other than that, not a lot of attention was paid. So we go to this church, it seats, I don't know, maybe 2,000 people maybe 3,000. I sit in the very back. I really don't want nothing to do with God. I'm making to my friend next to me sexual jokes about the worship leader who is, I didn't know, was the pastor's wife. And so I'm making sexual jokes about the people doing worship on stage. That's how far I was and how distant I was from God. So my friend's on my right, my girlfriend's on my left, and I'm kind of sitting there, not interested. A, a man named Jason Nettles, who's a good friend of mine now, is preaching this message about world missions. After the preacher got done preaching, I felt, now this might strike some unbelief in the audience here, but I felt something pulling on me, as if you were grabbing my shirt and pulling me to the altar. Now, I didn't know what it was, I just knew something is pulling me and I, I couldn't fight it to go to the altar. And I went forward to that altar and I stood there and I said something that's gonna make a lot of religious people upset right here. I said, God, I don't effing believe in you. I actually cussed at God, I didn't know. Now Isaiah claims that during the time he was up at the altar, he doesn't remember how long it was. Rather, he says that he remembers God speaking to him in an audible voice, telling him that he was going to go out into the world, that he was going to go preach the gospel in his name, and that at the same time, dirt began to come out of his eyes. And in that moment, I said that, again, an atheist didn't believe, the audible voice of God. We're not talking about a small voice. We're not talking about an inward. The audible voice of God from heaven said, Isaiah, I don't want 99.9% .9 of you. I want everything. And if you give me my, your life, I will use you to preach my gospel to all nations. And God, I, I was in a trance-like state. I wasn't, I didn't feel I was at the altar anymore. I was in, it was, I just saw glowing bright lights. Like I was in another dimension and I just heard the Lord speak to me and God began to show me in visions. Everything I'm doing right now, I saw 10 years ago, the traveling, the preaching, the miracles, the deliverances, revival in my home. I started seeing that that night. Um, one thing that I wanted to say that was very incredible that began to happen. When I came out of this vision, literal dirt started coming out of my eyes. I'm not talking spiritual. I'm not talking about mm -hmm. in the spirit. I'm a, I was an atheist five seconds ago. Dirt was coming out of my eyes and God began to remove the dirty scales that the world and, and lust and everything had put on me. And I was born again, speaking in tongues, trying to cover my mouth so my girlfriend wouldn't hear. I mean, no one was laying hands on me. I didn't know what it was. I had only heard tongues one time in my life. Mm. And now I'm sitting there oh, speaking violently in tongues and the Holy Spirit just really changed my life. All this to say that this apparently lasts an hour or more. As this is happening, I'm getting visions, I'm seeing lights, I'm in like this trance, I don't know vision or what it was. I'm, I'm there at the altar, you know, it's like when you get lost in the spirit, an hour goes by and it's like, feels like it's a minute. So I thought I was at the altar for a minute. I, I'm crying, I'm feeling something surging over my body, I'm getting visions of all these end times, me preaching on stages, God speaking to me saying, I'm gonna use you, I'm gonna raise you up, I'm gonna anoint you as a prophet, you're gonna travel, you're gonna preach, and I'm going, I'm just overwhelmed. So and after he gets up from the altar, he says that no one looks the same. In fact, the only person he recognizes is his sister, Cherish, and he says he has to go home. So I come out of this vision, and all I can say, guys, is I didn't recognize anybody. I didn't recognize anything, I didn't recognize anyone, Again, I get emotional talking about, but it was, it was, it was, I was born again. I was a new person. The old Isaiah didn't exist anymore. He was completely wiped off the face of the earth. It was a funeral that night for Isaiah and it was a birth for the new man. And I was, I was frantic because I, I didn't recognize anybody. And when I say I didn't recognize anybody, I really do mean that. And so I was kind of like, they turned the lights on and I'm kind of like panicking. What is going on? And you know, the people that came with me, like my girlfriend looked different. My friend looked different. Everybody looked different. I just didn't recognize the blue on the walls. Didn't look like blue. The greens didn't look like green. And my sister said, Hey, are you okay? Um, what, what's going on with you? I was like, I don't know. I just know I need to get home. I don't know what's going on with me. Mm. Whatever just happened to me, I don't ever want it to leave. And so I automatically connected this holy experience because that's what happens when the holy ghost mm -hmm. comes upon you you feel unholy mm -hmm. and i felt extremely unholy at that altar every as i got that encounter with the that's holy crazy. spirit and i was born again mm -hmm. i put my faith in jesus i looked at what he did on the cross i mm -hmm. accepted his salvation work of the cross i repented truly of my sins mm -hmm. that moment at the altar i felt so unclean as god began to wash me mm -hmm. i realized the the misery of my sin and the the worthlessness of everything i've been doing and i felt instant conviction the drinking was wrong. The cussing was wow. wrong. The smoking was wrong. The pornography was wrong. The sleeping with my girlfriend was wrong. The video games were wrong. Everything I felt instantly. So when I went home, I started purging everything.
The next day, Isaiah claims that he gets up to go to college, and as he's in class, he begins to receive prophetic words of knowledge about people sitting next to him. He starts to see demons above other people, and he begins to prophesy over absolutely everything and everyone he comes in contact with. I go to college the next day after not sleeping. I'm seeing demons and angels all over my college campus. So, mind you, I go from being this atheist to the next day, I remember driving to college on the freeway. I pulled over on the freeway, and I'm on the side of the freeway bawling like a baby. I'm on the side of the road going, why am I crying? And I'm at college, I'm seeing demons and angels. And I remember sitting in my college class and I'm hearing the thought of the guy next to me. I'm getting a word of knowledge. Now I didn't know about word of knowledge. I didn't know about prophecy. So I literally thought I'm sitting in college the next day and I'm getting a word of knowledge for the guy next to me about his life and his dad and some abuse he went through. And I'm like, I think I woke up a psychic. I think the devil entered me because I didn't know what word of knowledge or prophecy was. So I just thought, you know, maybe I'm a psychic. I don't know what's going on. And so all of a sudden, you know, I'm getting thoughts and I'm seeing things and I'm having these spiritual encounters. And I am in college the first day ever I left college early. This obviously alarms his family. His family actually keeps him home for the following days as he doesn't sleep and begins to talk incessantly about the things that God has called him to do and the things he is prophesying about the world and what is happening currently. I'm day after day after day talking for 12 hours straight, 14 hours. They had to baby, they had to take shifts to watch me. I'm not kidding. My mom, my dad, my uncle, my sister, they would take turns watching me because I would just talk for 12 to 14 hours. And there's something I used to do. Some of the stuff I'm gonna share is cringe, guys, but it's remember I just gotten saved, but I used to always do this thing where when I would talk, I would put my hand like this. I would be like, God is coming back, God is real, God is moving in our family. And they would be like, why are you doing that with my hand, your hand? And I would always say, whenever I use my hand like this, God is speaking through me. And the funny part is now I always go like this when I preach. And so it's like, I almost still do that, but I used to always go like this. You know, God is coming and, I would, and they would say, why are you doing that with your hand? And I would like, whenever I do this, God is speaking out of me. My family doesn't know what to do with me. Everyone's like, what is going on with Isaiah? Something's happening with him. Well, at the time, I had, and I'm telling everybody, you know, God is coming back tomorrow. God is real. I'm getting words of knowledge from my family telling them this happened to you. I had no filter. I mean, they were literally scared to take me out in public because I was prophesying. I would walk up to random people and be like, at four years old, this happened to you. God wants to heal you. I'd be in the middle of Save Mart. And they're like, what? You can't say that, Isaiah. I'm prophesying over our animals. I'm not kidding, guys. I was so radical, so sold out. I went home, deleted 40,000 songs off my iTunes, broke all my video games, broke all my music. I was just going all out because I knew God had done something in me and I didn't want to lose what God was doing. Now, obviously, the first few days of Isaiah's salvation were dramatically different for him, radically changed. Isaiah actually journals about the things he was seeing and praying about. January 12th, 2011. Today, my life got flipped upside down. I finally gave everything to God and he overwhelmed me with the Holy Spirit. He showed me what my future would be. I am an end time warrior. He gave me a vision. I was in North Korea on the front lines of an army of spiritual warriors. Everything was black and white. And as he poured out the Holy Spirit, color began to come back into the people's faces. The despair of the people there was something like I've never seen. I did not realize how life-changing this was till now. This was my first vision. The first time I seen my calling, my destiny, my life, me preaching before people. I would change millions of lives. This night, I got new eyes after church. I couldn't recognize anyone or anything. The dirty scales have been removed. January 13th, 2011. Wow, I'm starting to feel the Holy Spirit. His presence is more than I can imagine or handle. My mindset is fresh. I can't see anything the same. The old me has gotten wiped off the earth. I'm at school seeing the power of God everywhere. I'm looking around for lost souls. I'm understanding my calling and my purpose. It's almost so intense for me to bear. I'm craving prophecy, but the Lord is saying be patient. January 14th, 2011. My life is changing so fast. God is showing me so much and I'm still trying to control all this prophetic power and all these gifts he's entrusted in me. This is something like I've never experienced before. January 15th, 2011. I stayed up all night again, speaking about the Holy Spirit and trying to understand. I had two very important dreams of the future. The first dream, I was looking at a sea of people and I was hearing their thoughts and it was happening in seconds. God was stressing that this was fast. I seen their entire lives in seconds. The second dream, there was a sea of diverse people. Each person had a cord connected to them. They were all connected. God is showing me that there are people that are all over the world connected somehow spiritually. I'm still trying to figure it out. This day, the Lord was testing me with old desires 
and told me, if I give in, you will lose everything. He told me as fast as I've given you all this is as fast as you can lose it if you give in to temptations. January 16th, I stayed up all night again. I talked about God all night and I got, uh, and I received the power of prophecy. I'm supposed to go to Fresno, but I have a horrible feeling about it. Like I'm going to war. Tonight I'll be tested, but I'm ready to pass the test. God intervened and I didn't go to Fresno, but I found out the girl that I've been with for four years is my downfall who quenches my fire. It's the hardest test yet, but I must press on with God's call. If I do what he asked fast, the power of God will be po January 17th, 2011. It's been two days of no sleep. That's how intense the Holy Spirit has been. Tonight, God told me that we must pray. I broke up with Mackenzie like God has asked me to, and I'm ready for his blessings. Prayer was incredible. God used me to cast out 24 demons. The spirit is increasing. God showed me I will be mocked and killed for the gospel, but I'm ready for that sacrifice. He showed me his power today. Thank you, God. Eventually, his family contacts his uncle, Ben, which is also in ministry and currently in New York. Ben comes back, sits down with Isaiah and asks him, well, if this is true, what is the next thing the Lord has you doing? And Isaiah says, revival and prayer. Well, you don't understand. Jesus is coming back tomorrow. We're an end time army. And he's like, what is going on? And all my family's calling him. We don't know what happened to Isaiah. Something happened to Isaiah. He's not the same. He won't sleep. He won't eat. He's talking about end times, revival, last days, fivefold ministry, all these things. So they call him. They're like, you need to get you need to get home. There's something going on with Isaiah. And he's like, I'll be home soon. They're like, no, you need to get home now. Something happened to Isaiah. It was only a few short days after Isaiah's salvation did he decide to start a prayer meeting at his house. It had first started with friends and family. And now because of word of mouth, it was expanding outward. And he said, I, he, this is what he would tell me. Okay. God has raised you up. Mm -hmm. to reach this generation they think fast they talk mm -hmm. fast they're fast paced so that's how i always was and i thank god for him and like you said he poured into me mm -hmm. he didn't extinguish my fire and while isaiah had clearly already been experiencing the supernatural as he would state he asked his uncle ben or nino as he also calls him about a specific bible verse and this seems to be the pivot point at the very beginning of isaiah's ministry to go forward with this idea i remember one day Vlad telling my uncle I looked at Mark the book of Mark and I said wait the disciples are casting out demons mm -hmm. they're healing the sick they're raising the dead and I said can we do these things and he said that in his mind because he was involved in a mega church 30 years of organized religion he said in his mind he knew he could either neuter me right there and say no we can't do none of that or say Isaiah everything in this book we have access to wow. everything that God said in this book we can do and he told Come me that on. day everything we can do and so we started doing what was in the Bible? Come on. We didn't have this like, well, uh -huh. you know, brother, you need to go through four years of cemetery. I mean, seminary. <laughs> oh, yeah, brother, you need to go through this or that. Mm -hmm. We just knew the Bible. it was in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, my friends were getting saved. January 19th, 2011. Wow, I was late to work. I slept for one hour, but I don't even care. The physical pain I'm in is unbearable. I have demons living in me. It's not possession, but I'm afflicted. I'm seeing so much prophecy. Everyone I look at, God has given me a word for. I prophesied to my sister and God told me it's time for her breakthrough. She casted four demons out of me and it's her first time in the power of God. Thank God for letting me help her. There is one more demon that must come out. This is warfare. Tonight was unreal. I felt the power of God. Thank you, God, I've been delivered. Yeah, before so revival, I got, I got delivered lose. right before the revival broke out. It okay. was a couple days after getting saved. I would be sharing my faith and I would feel something like wanting to come out of my throat, like a scratchy or like uh -huh. wanting to cough. And I knew there was something there. I'm like, something's in me. I don't know mm. what this is. I was getting super weird, random, bizarre, demented thoughts that mm -hmm. I knew. I'm like, these thoughts are not my thoughts. Mm. I've never, even when I was in the world, I never had these thoughts. Wow. These are not my thoughts. There has to be something there. And then of course I'm reading the Bible. I'm like, oh, there's demons. Okay. There must be a demon in me wanting to come out of me. So I mm -hmm. actually tried doing self-deliverance in the parking lot of my college. I was in my car because this thing was like trying to come out of me. Mm -hmm. It didn't want to be in me and I couldn't get this thing out. So I go home and I tell my little sister, you're going to do deliverance on me. Cause again, I didn't have, I didn't know who else would do it. It was just me and my little sister and my uncle. Uh -huh. And she's like, what? I said, yeah, you're going to cast all these demons out of me. And these were spirits of shame, uh -huh. of perversion, of lust. January 20th, 2011, God moved mountains today. I spoke it to 500 kids. It was amazing. The breakthroughs in my friends and family are overwhelmed. Now, as Isaiah is trying to process the spiritual nature of what he's going through, he also has some spiritual encounters at work. But I remember even like one time I was at my job, I was so radically saved. And when you get radically saved, you all think like the world's ending tomorrow. And I remember being at Starbucks 
I was praying for people in the drive through Literally everyone at my job pretty much got saved. I was laying hands. We were seeing demons cast out. We were preaching at Starbucks. And we literally took over that Starbucks. And I remember one day thinking, I'm going to quit my job. I even called my mom. I said, Mom, I'm quitting my job because... God is telling me to put a potato sack on. I literally had an image of myself wearing a John the Baptist potato sack, but I thought I thought I was going to wear this potato sack and go on the corner of Main Street in Yosemite by Walmart and preach that end was coming. Now, somewhere between the 20th and the 25th of January 2011, they hold their first meeting officially, and 50 people show up. January 25th, 2011. God is moving so fast, I can't even keep up with journaling. The first prayer meeting we had, 50 people showed up and God moved. It's still all unreal, but I love it. Feelings I've never felt and people I've never met all day. I had a prophetic dream. It was the end of the world and I kept yelling, use the power of God, the end is here. I'm having insane end time dreams every night. They're hard to decipher. I don't want to lose my fire. There's so much at risk. One week and so much stuff has changed. Thank you, God. This is war. P.S. The devil is a liar. Even with the initial success of the prayer meeting, Isaiah is facing some hurdles in his life. However, these challenges he sees as part of a spiritual war that he is fighting against the devil. January 26th. Today was amazing. My cousin got completely transformed. Thank you, God, for fulfilling your promise. I prophesied to someone at the gym and he's hungry for God. Every day is one step closer to my destiny. Nothing can stop me. January 27, 2011. Today was probably the most challenging since my life got changed. My school drains me. I think this whole McKenzie situation is about to hit me. Time to pray for an hour and go to sleep. I have to press on. January 28th, 2011. Today was rough. The devil's using everyone and everything against me. The Lord has given me clear understanding to see who he is using. God is stripping everything from me and preparing me for my destiny. The world is calling and it starts in Hawaii. I'm seeing people in a new light and it's overwhelming, but it's necessary. The intimacy with God is what refuels me. This is war. Somewhere around this time, the daily prayers that were occurring in Isaiah's house transform into a Monday night revival in which anywhere between 50 and 70 people continue to come. February 7th, 2011. Monday night was amazing. I slayed nine people in the Holy Spirit. God kept showing up and showing off. I can feel the anointing stronger. About 70 people came tonight. And I got five prophecies that were all confirmed about me being a chosen vessel of God. The one prophecy was about persecution, but I'm not afraid. I don't serve a God of doubt or fear, but of love and war. I will go to barren lands and preach the word. I will die for God. I'm ready to suffer, to change lives. The Bible didn't say living for God is easy. I'm ready. It is also around this time that Isaiah writes in his journal that he has a bit of aggravation with the reality that he sees in front of him and the reality that the church acknowledges, namely demons being cast out. February uh, 9th, 2011, crazy day. I cast out two strong demons, hate and Cain. God protected me and his life got changed. It's sad how demons are so common, but everyone's so scared to talk about them because they're uneducated. School is my ultimate test. It drains me. The devil is trying to creep in. He's nonstop, but so am I. And so is my God. The church is even talking about the Monday revival. It's a sad reality. I had a dream and I was preaching and I woke up listening to myself preach. So weird. Every day I get a fresh outpouring experience. I'm the burning one and I will not be contained. God's love is so deep and tangible and it blows my mind. I thank God every second for using me to change so many lives. It's so funny how the devil thinks he can stop me. My God is a God of light. Nothing can stop. It is also around this time, as we heard in the journal entry, that Isaiah begins to learn how to preach. But who from? Now, I do want to say that we're going to take a little bit of time here to deep dive into his preaching style and why he preaches the way he does and who he claims taught him to preach. We're going to step back from sort of the timeline of his story just for a minute because I think this is incredibly important. Isaiah will eventually say that he's preached in 500 churches and preached thousands of messages. And if that's the case, understanding his preaching style is very important. People say, well, how'd you learn to preach? I'd never learned to preach. For months, I would go to bed and I would wake up in my body at night, standing up, preaching full on sermons. For months, this went on. My mom would say, oh, I heard you preaching again last night. I would literally wake up into my body preaching for, I don't know, three or four months. I would never wake up in my bed. I would wake up either on my knees, on the corner of the room, on my back, on my side, because literally every night I would wake up in the middle of the night and I'd be preaching full messages. And what God showed me was, I was teaching you to preach. The Holy Spirit was literally teaching me how to preach in the middle of the night. We also get a bit of an insight on how he teaches and why he teaches the way he does. I basically, my theory guys on teaching is if you have the New Testament and no one explained things to you, what would you come up with? 
So if you just read the New Testament, no one ever explained anything, you never heard a preacher, would you automatically come up with the courts of heaven? That's my teach. That's what I think about when I teach things. Like, is this something you'd get from the Bible if you didn't have anyone outside voices telling you what a verse says? Or, you know, what would you get? When we're speaking as preachers or influencers or pastors, we're not speaking with the authority of scripture. Like we're not definitively saying this is what this means. And I don't know if you guys um, believe in like revelatory preaching. I'm sure you do. Like if someone says, don't be like Zacchaeus and spectate the move of God, right? Or don't be like Peter and deny God at work. Like speaking revelatory, like saying Leviathan wants to shipwreck your faith is like symbolic, not literal. So like if you look at, for example, um, 1 Timothy 1.19, it says, cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. For some have deliberately, deliberately violated their conscience. As a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. So like Paul is using the word shipwreck as an illustration for what happens when you deliberately violate your conscience. He's not literally saying, hey, your faith is a literal ship and it's going to wreck. So I think too, when we teach and preach like revelatory or like we're using symbolism or examples, it could also be misconstrued as you're saying this is exactly what the Bible says, which for me, my video of Jezebel or my video of Leviathan, I didn't say there's a verse that says Leviathan's a spirit or Jezebel's a spirit. I'm saying from what I draw from scripture, this is what I believe. This is my conclusion. And because I'm the one, you know, speaking it or sharing it, this is what I think. Just like anything we would preach. I mean, I don't think any of us get up and preach for an hour and preach word for word, literal text of scripture and say, this is definitively. And now I understand a number of us may not understand or have ever heard of revelatory preaching. So what I want to give to you is a minute and a half example from a very early sermon that Isaiah preached just a few years into the ministry. But I think that God is bringing back zeal. Remember when he turned the tables and he said, zeal for my father's house? The Bible says he knocked over the dove chairs. They literally had in the temple, oh, you got to hear this thing. I'm not preaching this, but I'm going to go into my message in a second. In the temple, they had doves in cages. Isaiah, please explain to me what that means. It means we've locked up the ghost. We've locked up the dove. What does a dove represent? You got to hear this. Nine feathers on the left side, nine gifts of the spirit. Nine feathers on the right side, nine fruits of the spirit. Five tail feathers, the fivefold ministry. We have locked up the gifts we have locked up the fruits we have locked up the fivefold but this is so startling the bible says jesus came flipped the tables which is a picture of the tables are getting turned and god's about to use nobody's now he flips the tables and the next verse you won't believe what it says it says the sick and the lost and the lame and the disease begin to flock the temple and he begin to heal them. I believe that when the Holy Ghost begins to move, when we unlock him from the box, when we let him out of his cage, when we say, God, there's no time schedule. God, do what you want to do. I feel the Holy Ghost on this thing. Let the fire come like on Acts 2. I believe, I think this is what happened. They were sitting there sick in the city and all of a sudden they saw at the temple doves flying. Now, along with this, the journal entries become more sporadic, mainly because Isaiah is being asked to speak at a number of different conferences. And this is where I need to step back to before we jump back into the timeline. One of the things that seems to be ignored in this entire process early on in Isaiah's ministry is 1 Timothy 3, verse 6 specifically. When Paul, writing to Timothy, says about elders, he must not be a recent convert or he may be puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now, Isaiah, a new convert, is being asked to preach at a number of different conferences. We'll actually see that here in a very short amount of time, less than a year from his salvation, he'll be asked to preach in front of millions of people. And so the question becomes, is this the biblical thing to do? Now, I want to be very clear that I can't find a ton of evidence of this, but there are places upon the internet and comment sections and articles that have been written saying that in the early days, Isaiah refused to be corrected. In fact, if it wasn't his way, it was the highway. And I think this is an indication of the thing that Paul was trying to prevent when he talks to Timothy. Now, to be transparent, his uncle does go with him on almost every single speaking engagement, as far as I can tell. And in some of these videos, actually speaks before before he gets up saying this. So God is raising up a radical unorthodox warrior. These are no limit soldiers and, uh, and, and they need fathers. The Bible says, Paul says you'll have many teachers but few fathers and mothers to raise up this next generation. This is the problem with the evangelists of, of past is that they had no fathers. And these move of gods died out really quick. But this next generation we have patriarchs and matriarchs that are fathering and mothering over us that have paved the way so we're able to do this thing right and responsible. Amen? Amen. So can you guys help me welcome my nephew, Isaiah Saldivar. 
So it's something that we just need to consider as we look at the overall story of Isaiah. Was it too early for him to preach, even if he did have his uncle as his spiritual oversight? That being said, he's invited to a number of conferences to speak. March 28th. Wow, I can't even journal. There's too much to say. I spoke at a conference. It was an amazing weekend. I spoke to over 20 pastors in partation. We did two healing sessions. The first lady I prayed for got healed of heart failure. Her shoulder was out of place and her leg was literally popped out. As I prayed, I can feel it moving in my hand. It was truly incredible. I was able to speak at the conference for 30 minutes and it came out perfect. The Holy Spirit never lets me down. I did an altar call of fire at the end. I got a prophetic word in front of the church went to the streets tonight and I scared a witch doctor and I prayed healing over a woman with a walker and she got healed. The spirits are pouring out and doors are opening faster than I could walk through. I need to quit my job. Too much wasted time. Lord, open a, a financial door, please. Thank you. I love you, Jesus. It's during this time that Isaiah obviously is experiencing quite a bit of success, traveling, the growth of the ministry at his home, but this doesn't come without some opposition. And he writes about this as well as talks about the one time he almost quit here. April 10th now. Incredible stuff's happening. I went to minister in Sanger. I preached at a church. Going on 17th to bring revival to Patterson. I'm confident God will show up. I delivered somebody again. My demon counts about 60. Continuing to be a soldier and wage war with against Satan. No longer waiting for the attack. I'm declaring all out war and I'm going to be the first to attack Satan. Had a vision that there were tons of doors and as I chose one to go through, more appeared. I seen a page writing but couldn't make out what it said. The cry of the hour is, God, I want more. I'm starving for a fresh encounter with the living God. The Bible's so clear when it says a prophet is not welcome in his hometown. So much opposition. My main focus is to be 100% led by the Spirit of God. The presence of the Spirit shifts people, and churches go from survival to revival. I must journal more. God, give me time. Putting all my trust in Him and relying on His Word, I feel myself maturing in Christ. Quickly, the Spirit is upon me. Lord, help me stay out of the way so you can drive my life. Let me live out the calling on my life. I need you. There was, this is going to sound kind of weird, but there was one moment when I had first gotten saved. Maybe I was saved like three or four months. Probably the only time in my faith where I was like going to throw in the towel was I'd heard some of my best friends in the world that I grew up with were like making fun of me, talking bad That's about sad. me. Yeah, like I was just, <laughs> I felt like I had no friends. I was a loser, a loner. Because I was saved, I, I felt like I lost all my like real friends I was in the world. And so someone was like, yeah, you should hear. I was at this party. I don't remember who it was, but someone told me they're like, I was I at a party. Know this. Yeah, and they were like, I've shared this before, but I'm gonna, sh you'll probably make sense in a second. And they're like, everyone was talking bad about you. Oh, you're this cult leader now, and you're a Christian, and you, like, these are people I grew up with and knew for like years that were yeah. best friends of mine. So I was, I felt like I was like, I'm done with God. God, how could you? Like, I have no friends. And I, I told God, I'm like, I need you to speak to me. If you don't speak to me, and don't do this, guys. This was my early days. I'll save a few months. But I was like, if you don't speak to me, I'm going back to the world. I'm going to the party. I'm this. I'm that. I was just like really mad at God, I guess. And I said, I'm going to open my Bible. And I did one of those. I'm going to open my Bible, yeah. speak to me, which I don't <laughs> recommend you guys doing that. Don't think about this. So I'm about, I, I wanted to quit. I wanted to be like, I'm done with God because all my friends are talking bad about me. I'm the laughing stock of the city. And I opened my Bible to this verse. Okay. So I'm only saved a few months. It's all fresh. I don't even know the Bible well. I haven't finished the Bible. This portion of scripture, I've, I don't probably have never read at this point. First Peter 4.4. 4. Look at this. Okay. So remember the context. I'm about to quit. My friend's talking bad about me. First Peter 4.4. 4. I open my Bible. This is the first thing I read. Of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the wild flood of destructive things they do. So they slander you. But remember that they will have to face God who stands to judge everyone, both the living and the dead. It was around this time that three major events happened for Isaiah in regards to his life and ministry. The first is that the girl that would eventually become his wife, Alyssa, visits the prayer meeting. My wife got saved like a month or two after me. She came, her friend said, oh, there's a bunch of these guys at this house, let's just go. And so they came, she thought I was crazy. And then she wanted to come back the next week. And so her friend was coming because her friend was like, oh, there's a bunch of hot guys at this house. That's why her friend was coming. But my wife ended up having an encounter with God so she was like, you know, there's like a prayer meeting and all this stuff and we can go to it. And I kind of just blew her off because I'm like, why would I go to Manteca? I don't even know where that's at. Like all this stuff. She's like, OK, I'll take you to the mall. But first, we're going to stop at this this house. Wow. <laughs> the whole point was there was a bunch of young people. Like it looked yeah, like a it party. Was, it did. It looked like a party. Yeah. There's people packed everywhere. And the videos are online. There's cars in the parking lot everywhere. And we're you all young. We're this. all 19, 20. But it was a lot of young people. Yeah. We were all college age, getting saved. She called it like a prayer meeting thing. Yeah. 
So we were there. There was a lot of attractive young people there because we were all yeah. partying and all that, right? We weren't like these. Just, and I'm just being real. We weren't like these nerdy, like no, no, you know no. what I mean, kids. It so, literally was like they partied last week. Yes, and, and then it was we're attractive. Like, it was yeah. attractive to like our age people because yeah. they're like, oh, you guys are. It's like guys, something new. Yeah, they're like, you guys don't smell weird. You're not like normal Christians. Like you guys weird. are cool. Yeah. So I show up to the living room. To the living room, cars everywhere, and like people are outside. People are just. It literally looked like a house party. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, whatever. When I walk in, there was just Bibles all over the floor. <laughs> they were saving their seats. They were saving their seats. Yeah, yeah, because there was like, no room in the house. And I, I just remember being so confused because I'm like, what is happening? Like, from somebody not saved, it looked really... Yeah, it looked very cultish. We it, were in a house did. with Bibles all over the floor. Very, I'm like, okay, this is crazy. The second notable event that occurs during this time is they come up with the name for the prayer meeting. They've been meeting for a while, and they need a name for it. We oh, back, sorry. back in the day, we started out. Is we it a secret? No, it's not. Nobody oh. knows, but it's funny. We didn't know anything about anything, and we named our ministry Generation Fellowship. Actually, I don't even think it had a name when I came. No, it didn't have a name, it but we ended up name. naming it Generation Fellowship, yeah. which is like the cheesiest name ever. Yeah. But we were like, it's old people with young people and this. It's so we're like a generation yeah. that fellowships. <laughs> GF. Was, yeah, we called it GF. <laughs> It was so cheesy. We had like these shirts that were like the absolute cheesiest shirts in the world, but it was amazing for the time. Yeah. And then we had this prayer meeting. God's like the name's the awakening. Yes. And all of this is taking place while Isaiah and his family are trying to find a larger area to hold the awakening 209. There's even this video of his uncle Nino or Ben during an interview in which he's talking about expanding the awakening 209 to an overflow center in a garage at the back of Isaiah's parents' property. So now that we're here uh, in Manteca, uh, one, three, 940 on Castle Road here in Manteca. And for the last 11 months, God has been pouring out His Spirit upon this whole region. And we have been getting people coming hours away from Fairfield, from Sacramento, from the Bay Area, all the way from uh, Pacifica. People have been coming from all over hearing about what God is doing here in Manteca. So this is what we're doing. God has been showing up, he's been showing off. There's been signs, wonders, miracles, and the best miracle of all has been salvation. So we're excited about that. We can't stop it, we were in the house. Now as you see, we're here in this barn, we're converting it over because God is just opening up new avenues for us. And this is, this is only another step to where God has taken us. We know that God is doing great things. This is called the awakening. We're not a ministry, we're not a movement, because those things stop, we're not a past revival. It's what's happening now here in Manteca. So this is what we're doing. God is just showing up and showing off. The third notable thing that happens at this time, and something that actually will change Isaiah's course of ministry forever, is somebody from Morning Star TV visits the revival. Shortly after that, you actually started to preach in, in other places. In fact, was it a month after your conversion that you were on the same stage with Rayhard Bonke and you had no idea who that person was? Yeah, so it wasn't a month. So the revival broke out of the house. I'm uh -huh. sharing my testimony that. I mean, people were literally hundreds outside listening through the window, looking through the windows. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, I have videos of this and pictures you can find mm -hmm. on my social media. I'd be preaching with people sitting on my feet. And then someone from Morningstar, which was Rick Joyner's ministry, found mm -hmm. out about it and mm -hmm. came down and did like a worship song at our house. This was probably seven or eight months, nine months, maybe in, uh, okay. and went back and told Rick Joyner, there's this revival at this house I've never seen. She's like, I've been all over the world. I've been in crusades. I've never in my life seen anything like this. She mm -hmm. cried the whole time she was at her house. Wow. She told Rick Joyner, you need to get this guy. While Isaiah didn't know it at the time, this invitation from Rick Joyner to come preach at his conference is actually going to change his entire course of ministry. But there's a lot of things that happen in between being invited and actually going to speak. Now, in 2012, Isaiah's uncle files the Awakening 209 as a California nonprofit religious organization. If you look at the documents, it actually says it was formed in 1964, and that seems like a very odd date given that the Awakening started in 2011, just a year prior. But the reason it's filed like that is that it's actually a child organization. A child organization means that it's simply under another organization. And it seems like at this point in 2012, the Awakening joins a church network, specifically the Full Gospel Fellowship of Churches and Ministries International, the Fellowship Network for short. And they use this organization at least up until 2017 as a way to file their taxes and account for their income. I have no idea what happens after 2017, but up until then we have some IRS documentation demonstrating their income and their expenses as well as some travel expenses and whatnot. We know this because the filing of the address is the exact same P.O. box that Isaiah uses all the way up till this day. There are two major things that happen in 2012 as well that will change his life forever. This is a very 
very important time in his life. You see, it was during this time that both Isaiah and his future wife were attending Kingdom Covenant Leadership Institute. This is apparently where Isaiah pursues his doctorate of theology and a minor in business. Now, he never actually talks about where he gets his degree in theology. He never has stated on any podcast that I can find where this is from. My wife's in the ministry for about a year. Mm -hmm. We go to Bible college together. So now I'm in Bible college, okay? So if you guys don't know, I have a bachelor's degree in theology. I started Bible college. I did four years. I got a legit bachelor's degree in theology, not a certificate from like some charismatic school. I got a mm -hmm. legit theology degree, went to Bible college, got trained in the word. The only thing I was able to find was on an old website archive from a, one of his original sites in which it states that he was pursuing a doctrine in theology from this Kingdom Covenant Leadership Institute. Now, the only Kingdom Covenant Leadership Institute that I can find ever in existence it was ran by a Dr. Pat Francis. And while it started in Canada, it seems like they also had a satellite campus that was set up in Savannah, Georgia around August of 2012. The school is meant to be done via satellite. Uh, Isaiah talks about that in some of his videos. So I'm in Bible college now at our local church. We had like a satellite school. So mm -hmm. it was a big Bible college, but they would basically zoom into our church and we'd have 100 students in the Bible college. Mm -hmm. And the satellite teaching would be done by teachers such as Prophet Chuck Pierce, Peter Wagner, John Eckert, as well as Dr. Pat Francis herself. In the program? Yes, we have an exciting staff of people. These are global leaders. They're global apostles and prophets and bishop, bishops that are, are teaching and training all over the world. We have uh, Prophet Chuck Pierce, Dr. Peter Wagner. Uh, we have uh, just a, a huge lineup, John Eckhart. We have uh, Dr. Pat Francis, of course, and Dr. Pat, Pat Francis is the founder of these schools, uh, which she's in Canada. Given all the information we have from Isaiah's archive site, as well as what he said in various podcasts and what the Kingdom Covenant Leadership Institute promotional video promotes, this seems to be the college that Isaiah went to. Now, as I mentioned before, something else happens to Isaiah during this time that also alters the course of his life. You see, Isaiah had had no interest in dating anyone. He didn't think he would maybe even ever get married. But while he was at college, something happens in a particular prophecy class. Mm -hmm. None of that. My wife's in the ministry for about a year. Mm -hmm. We go to Bible college together. So now I'm in Bible college. Mm -hmm. And the pastors, the speaker is talking about hearing the voice of God. And he says, I want everyone to go find an area in the room, lay down or get on your knees, basically humble yourself before God and don't get up until God speaks something to you. It could be a little impression. It could be, you know, a voice. It could be death. It could be God giving you a prayer. Pray for this person. Just get a word from God. Get something. It was a whole class on prophecy. Mm -hmm. I go and lay by the drum set in this big church and I'm on my face praying, Lord, what do you have to speak to me? And I thought Vlad, it was going to be, you're going to Africa. You're going to India. Here's this. And mm -hmm. I hear it. I hear it as audible as is audible, right? Like it, to me, it was audible. It wasn't mm -hmm. audible. Like the night I got saved where yeah. I was hearing it from the outside, mm -hmm. but in my spirit, I heard audible voice. Alyssa is your wife. And she's in Bible college with me as well at the time. So from that moment on, I knew she was going to be my wife. Feelings did started have, stirring up. Did I, you have feelings for her already? Or you started to get feelings uh, after you I heard mean, about I that? Didn't, I didn't have feelings like that where I was like, I want to marry you. I mm -hmm. was definitely like, she's attractive, but it wasn't anything like feelings. It wasn't like, oh, I want to marry this girl or, oh, this is going to be my wife. And remember, I told God, if I get feelings, yeah. it has to be my, be my wife, wife right? Yeah. So from that moment on, it was like a switch turned on. I went from being, I don't ever want to be with any girls. I don't even look at a girl. Don't even mm -hmm. talk to me if you're a female to this is going to be my wife. Um, we literally met with my pastor, told my pastor what I felt, talked to her parents, asked her dad if I could marry her at our revival service. There's 700 people there. No one knew anything. Again, we didn't date none of that. And I proposed to her and we got married two and a half months later. <laughs> They have a very short engagement simply because Isaiah is going to be speaking a lot after September. And so they decide to get married on September 15th of that same year. Now, right after he returns from his honeymoon, Isaiah goes directly into speaking at a number of different conferences, specifically the one we spoke about earlier from Morning Star TV. And this is the conference that really opens the door for Isaiah in a number of different areas. Oh. So we fly out there. 
we get to it, it's a massive building, five story. It's like a hotel atrium. It was uh, mm -hmm. Jim Baker's old building, the old PTL building. And I'm in this massive building, huge auditorium, several thousand seats. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be on God TV, 40 million viewers total. And I'm like, I'm speaking Friday night, Reinhard Bonnke speaking Saturday. I'm saved like a year. Glad I didn't even know the names of all the 12 disciples yet by heart. I was like, didn't know hardly anything. And I'm looking him up and I see 7 million in Africa, 5 million in Africa, 60 million plus saved. And I'm like, uh -huh. this guy is a legend. So when I met Reinhard Bonnke uh -huh. that night, that was the first time I ever had, like, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have this, like, these guys are superstars. Uh -huh. I just knew, Hey, God touched my life. And mm -hmm. so I told my uncle, I'm like, what should I do? Cause I was thousands of people. It's five mm -hmm. stories. It was just overwhelming cameras. Here I am from a living room. I'm mm -hmm. like, dude, I'm, in a, I'm preaching in a living room. What pretty am I doing nerve, here? Pretty, pretty nerve wracking. Pretty nerve -wracking. It, it was nerve wracking. And this is why my uncle said, he said, Isaiah, be yourself. And mm -hmm. they will recognize that God is with you, that God's presence is on you. Mm -hmm. And I got up there and I preached and I preached my heart out. I shared my testimony. I talked about being radical for God. No more of this Sunday morning only. We got to go all in. Halfway through the service, people were running to the altar, crying, repenting, turning wow. to God. We didn't get out of that building, Vlad, until and out of that service, back to our hotel room till about two o'clock in the morning. We stood there and prayed for wow. every single person. We saw miracles. We saw the power of God. And that 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 was one time where one guy told me that this will be your, for lack of a better term, coming out of the closet. And from wow. that day on, really? Vlad, I kid you not, I was fully booked for the last 13 years from that wow. one event. That one event was the 2012 Harvest Fest hosted by Morningstar Ministries. And Isaiah was right. After that, he had booking after booking after booking. Along with this, Isaiah is trying to find a more permanent location for the Awakening 209. They had obviously outgrown his parents' house. They had apparently decided not to renovate the garage that was mentioned in the video earlier from his uncle. And they go to a number of different churches. I can't tell how many in total, but it looks like around three. One of which was the church he proposed to his wife in. Eventually, they end up in the West Valley Pentecostal building. But it wasn't just the Awakening 209. While Isaiah was speaking at other churches, other awakenings were happening as well. All of them called the Awakening, followed by the area code of the location in which the Awakening was happening. So you had such awakenings as the Awakening 715 in Wisconsin, the Awakening 760 in San Diego County, Oceanside, and one of the more prolific awakenings and one that Isaiah spoke at often, which was the Awakening 604 at Transformed Central Church in Canada. Now, of the videos we have available to us from 2013, there are basically only two primary sources in which we can mine from. The first is the Awakening 604 at Transform Central Church in Canada, which has the most videos available. And secondly, the limited number of videos still available on Morningstar TV of Isaiah and his speaking there. Now, the only reason this is important is because it does give us an idea of how Isaiah preached back in 2013 and gives us a sort of a baseline to see if he's changed or morphed at all in his topics and how he speaks. Use us like the prophet Isaiah. He said, whom shall I send? And he said, Nothing send me. It didn't matter what you look like. It didn't matter that you had mocos and tears. Exactly if you know what, what that means, heard. that's bogus. See, when you begin to walk by emotions and not by faith, you're going to give up your God-given inheritance. We can't walk by the fact. Two, three, four. Now, 2013 is a very busy year for Isaiah. In fact, by the time we get to 2014, he decides to launch a website and a blog to let people know where he will be speaking and the latest Awakening 209 events. It's from this website that we can see sort of the early days of what Isaiah was going for in his ministry. For example, one of the first landing pages for his site was called Isaiah Saldivar, Revival in the Eyes of a Newborn, where he had three specific goals, save the lost, revive the save, and equip the saints. Now, none of the blogs from the original site are available. For whatever reason, they're corrupted or they look like they've been hacked. I'm not sure which, but they're not there anymore. We do have some of the media page, which we've already shown, as well as some early signs that Isaiah was selling some digital sermon packs available to buy to support the ministry and what he was doing. Now, last thing, last thing before I start. We have product in the back. I'm going to go real quick this morning. We have product in the back. We have flash drives. Long story short, 20 messages for $30. If you don't know what that is, your grandkids do, your kids do. Okay, you plug it into your computer and you get the files right there. It's small. Um, we have hip-hop CDs. I know that sounds like a cuss word in the church, but these guys that are, it's actually my brother, they're doing music and they're changing culture. That ministry, being the Awakening 209, 
as well as speaking at different churches and conferences. And we see this continue into 2014. Isaiah continues to speak at the Awakening 209, as well as the Awakening 604, and is invited to a number of different churches to either speak at the church specifically or to speak at their conference. Just a few examples of these are the World Revival Church, the Focus Conference held at Rock Virginia Beach Church, as well as speaking at Harbor Light Church. To say his schedule was hectic is an understatement. In fact, Isaiah explains it this way. Literally, my schedule was I would leave on Thursday or Friday, usually mm -hmm. Thursday. I would get home Monday afternoon from traveling. And then we go to the meeting. We'd go straight to a meeting. Mm -hmm. I was in the meeting. I would stay up till three in the morning getting a sermon ready. Tuesday, we had our service. Yeah. I would be gone and all day. And you would day. leave at like two or something. Yeah, yeah, I would leave, I think, at noon. And then, uh, yeah, around to that. To do worship. Yeah, to go to the worship, mm -hmm. to go be at, open the church, pray. I would spend all day at the church praying, mm -hmm. getting ready for a sermon. Get home super late Tuesday, Wednesday pack, and Thursday leave yeah. again. That was like years, years of just grinding and traveling and preaching and being gone. And you came with me a lot in the beginning. And then when we had justice, you came with me yeah. some, but then it just got harder and yeah, harder. harder. Now, it's around this time that some of the social media accounts for The Awakening 209 begin to change. For example, for some reason, the Twitter account continues to post and repost up until about the mid-2015s. The Facebook page, I have no clue about because it is no longer available to the public. And the YouTube page seems to become more of Isaiah's personal YouTube page rather than The Awakening landing page for their videos. Now, in 2015, Isaiah keeps up his speaking regiment. He speaks at Without Walls Church in Arizona. It seems to be maybe one of the first time he speaks there, but he continues to go back to this church over the years. Then, going into 2016, Isaiah continues his speaking schedule, starting at a number of different churches, one of which being Fresh Start Church, a church in which he has a very interesting story about, and a story that only happens because the awakening from Canada actually cancels coming to see him. As I was top golfing with a guy named Landon Shot, and he said, hey, there's a guy named David that wants you to come speak at his youth conference at a church called Fresh Start. Would you be interested? I said, yeah, I'm down. If you think they're legit, let's do it. And I was already preaching in Arizona a lot at the time. I was preaching every month in Arizona. So I go to do a youth conference. The night I was there, this was six years ago, revival broke out that night. And the pastor said, will you come back next week? Um, and I was like, I can't because there's a group from Canada coming. They ended up canceling. I went back next week and then it was full blown revival. And then I went back again and then I was going every single Now along month. with Fresh Start Church, Isaiah speaks at a number of other churches as well. The Rock Church in Arizona, as well as the Awakening 604 in Canada. Though at the end of 2016, the Awakening 604 of Canada just sort of stops. But this doesn't mean Isaiah stops speaking at churches. In fact, going into 2017, he speaks at a number of different churches, including LifeSpring Community Church in Georgia, as well as a number of times at Fresh Start Church. Now, into 2018, between speaking at the Awakening 209 and speaking at Fresh Start Church, he also preaches at the Awakening 715, which is an awakening that apparently up until 2018 is still going. These awakenings seem to be a revolving revival service each year now, with the awakenings meeting occasionally and Isaiah coming to speak at them at various times during the year. This is the same thing at the Without Walls Church. It's a yearly event in which Isaiah comes to do revival and then leaves and comes back the next year. Now, I do want to note with this sort of revolving door of revivals each year, there does seem to become a bit of weariness involved in them. Isaiah, up to this point, is very much a revivalist in regards to being invited to sort of revive the people at these different events. I did have the opportunity to speak to a worship leader at one of the previous mentioned churches. I won't name it because it's not important, but it's one of the things that they said that really caught my eye. Now, one of the things they did say is that Isaiah is the same offstage as he is on stage. There is no hypocrisy. There is consistency in what he says and how he lives. However, they did mention revival fatigue. And this is something that comes up a lot, especially with pastors like Isaiah. As when you invite them each year to your church for a specific revival, you kind of know what they're going to say because they've said it before. They go on in the message to say this. Yes, his message was focused primarily around repentance and revival, although in most services I wasn't sure if I was even making the cut of a Christian because he was talking a lot about how Christians aren't even living godly lives, etc. He did sprinkle in some healing and deliverance back then. It just got to the point to where I could predict the flow of the service. He'd get up on stage and preach about how sinful we all are. He'd open the altar. We'd play Let It Rain and set a fire for 45 minutes. He'd work his way through the crowd, praying and such, and eventually someone would close the service. Now, I don't think anybody has anything against revivalistic preaching. 
Rather, maybe it's more the way it's done. It's one of those things where if you're beat over the head over and over again, told you're not good enough, not doing enough, you're too lazy, you don't have enough faith, you can get to the point to where revival burnout occurs. Jesus did not leave eternity, give up his divine privileges, be born of a virgin, come to the earth as a man, get baptized in the Holy Spirit, have a ministry for three and a half years so that you one day, he didn't look and say, oh, in 2,000 years, one day in Stockton, they're going to come on Sunday and warm a chair and for an hour give me a little leftover worship and leftover praise and then go the rest of the week living like the devil jesus did not think that when he died on that cross when he was up there on that cross he was thinking that there's going to be a person called the holy spirit that's going to dwell in believers and they're going to live a supernatural victorious life and i'm going to put to shame every principality and every power on that cross jesus disarmed demons on the cross the Bible says this, he disarmed and made a public shame out of the principalities and powers. These are high ranking demons that run governments and run cities and run countries. And we're all puppets in their game according to Ephesians 6 that we're wrestling against spirits, not flesh and blood. Every battle that we're facing is a spiritual battle. They're not natural battles. And Jesus said, here's what I'm gonna do. It is on that cross, I'm gonna disarm and I'm gonna take the power from the enemy. And now you no longer, now you, you might still, but that's a choice. You don't have to live subject to anxiety. You don't have to live subject to depression. You don't have to live subject to the status and all these demonic spirits. I've disarmed them and given you the keys. And so the only access the enemy has over you is the access you gave him. In fact, with some of the teaching and some of the preaching that Isaiah does, it seems to indicate that he believes that if you're not trying hard enough, doing enough, or believing enough, then that anxiety or depression or other sin in your life is there because you allow it to be or because you don't desire to be free enough. In fact, he says as much when he talks about how many times somebody should be delivered. How often would you recommend to go in for a session? I mean, I change my oil on my car every 3,000 miles, so it's no problem getting an oil change every few months. I would I would go through deliverance every couple months, every six months. It depends on how free you want to be. I mean, <laughs> if you're okay with, if you're, now listen, if you're not having any symptoms, right? There's no, no overwhelming desires, no perverted thoughts being created, no nightmares, no, and you're not having no symptoms, then hey, there's plenty of people we need to work on. Don't hit me up, right? Like, you don't need to keep coming and coming and coming, but, if there's symptoms and there's signs and there's things that are dragging you away, there's voices there, there's overwhelming desires, perverted thoughts, then go for a deliverance. But again, I don't want to create people that are deliverance junkies yeah. that are addicted to deliverance. This leads some of his critics to say that he preaches a works-based salvation, something he adamantly denies. Heading into 2019, the Awakening 209 is still going. It's still going in the same building, the West Valley Pentecostal building that it's been going in since 2014. However, in December of 2019, Isaiah claims that God came to him and told him, as well as his uncle, back in October of 2019, that they needed to go online with the revival. I've announced this on the internet, but I haven't gone into detail with anybody about this. We're lit Now, I'm not saying to do this, please. We're crazy, we're wild, and we're just different than most churches, okay? So don't listen to this and be like, well, every church should. No, it's just what God's called us to do. We are so believing this that God told me and told my uncle three months ago, we pastor our church in Manteca. He said, next year, I don't want you meeting in your building. The only time I want you meeting is for Monday night prayer. I'm talking about we have several hundred people that are showing up every week. I mean, we're packing out the building to the back and the Lord says I don't want you to meet he said I want you to go back to the, the the street that the revival started in nine years ago and I want you across the street where my uncle lives we rent we're renovating his entire house and the Lord said I want you to meet there and I want you to stream and broadcast a house revival movement because I'm getting ready to come in the home of every person in America I'm getting ready to invade people's living rooms he said Isaiah the days of them coming to hear you preach and flying across the country are over Isaiah takes this seriously and actually starts broadcasting worship services from his uncle's living room, encouraging other believers to get together with their families and friends every Tuesday night and do the same. And it's important to note the reason why he's doing this is because he believes that the Lord spoke to him to stop meeting with the awakening and start at-home revivals across the entire country. Now, the only evidence of them attempting to do this is from an Instagram post in March of 2020 before everything shut down. Uh, there's nothing really online that I can find anywhere about them attempting to do it after that. Instead, it seems like Isaiah continues what he had started in January of 2020, which is doing online streaming either with guests or by himself.
Why did you stop pastoring your church? Because God told me to shift all of my focus and attention in 2019 at the end to live streaming. I thought it was crazy. Everyone thought I was crazy. I thought I was crazy. And then in January, 2020, I launched online and went full time with online. And this is exactly what Isaiah does at the beginning of 2020. Isaiah starts his first endeavors into live streaming and podcasting with a podcast called Revival Lifestyle, the first episode airing on January 8th of 2020. Now, at first, it's just him and his brother and maybe a few other guests talking about revival and talking about Christianity. Eventually, he does get guests on, like Alexander Pagani, which he eventually becomes friends with. Also, we can see from this screenshot that the Demon Slayers apparently started as the Demon Busters, but then upgraded their name. Not sure which is better, but just interesting side fact as well as Vlad Savchuk, which he also eventually becomes friends with. However, Isaiah starts Friday Night Fire around April 11th of 2020, each live stream starting at 6 p.m. And this seems to be his first live stream by himself in which he preaches and takes questions at the end. I'm grateful for the deliverance, even in my own life. Some people say, Isaiah, why are you so into healing? It's because I've been healed. Why are you so into prayer? It's because prayer has changed my life. Why are you so into deliverance? It's because I'm deliverance is number one this format is to be the beginning of what seems to gain his channel some traction most videos haven't broken three or four thousand and this stream occasionally has up to eight thousand but continues to go up as the channel grows his first viral video seems to be a video entitled ex-satanist high priest john ramirez must see which ranks up at the recording of this video at 1.4 million views and by the end of 2020, Isaiah has already ranked up 10,000 subscribers on YouTube, a number that we'll see quickly grows. But in addition to this, he redoes his entire website, adding the tab Deliverance to it. Now, it's not as if Isaiah hadn't talked about Deliverance up until this point. Obviously, he had preached about it. His ministry started with Deliverance. But this is when he begins to add the tab to his site, and it becomes more prominent. In fact, by the end of 2020, Isaiah already has a Deliverance map on his site. There's only 100 people that have applied for this deliverance map, but 120 plus applications, he says, that they're still reviewing. And that's basically a map where believers who do deliverance can go, they sign up, and now they're on a map, and those that need deliverance can reach out to their other brothers and sisters in their area and get delivered, baptized in the Holy Spirit, baptized in water, whatever it could be. Because the problem was people were saying, you preach on casting out devils, but there's no churches around me that will do it or pray for me. So we made this map. Can I contact you for personal deliverance? I don't offer personal one-on-one -on -one deliverances um, because I have too many people that want deliverance from me. That's why I've made a deliverance map because I'm one person, I can't deliver everybody. And I think it's a negative thing when we try to do it all. Like I'm the guy that's gonna deliver you. I'm the guy, I wanna empower the body of Christ to do it. And the idea behind this deliverance map is to mark people on the map that will also perform deliverance ministries like Isaiah, since he can't get there to do deliverance on everyone. Now, to be added to the deliverance map, you have to fill out an online application in order to be added to the map. And as Isaiah has noted in some of his posts, there is a vetting process that occurs during it. However, I don't know how deep the vetting process is. I only say this because when you click on some of the churches on the deliverance map, some of the things that they say within their description are a bit concerning and I would have thought would have been caught in a vetting process. All this to say is that Isaiah does have a disclaimer at the top of his deliverance map that he isn't responsible for any of the interactions you have with the people that are connected to the map. And I'm sure this is for legal reasons. All this to say that deliverance takes more of a front facing position in Isaiah's ministry now that he is online and talking about it more. This isn't to say that he doesn't do deliverance. Obviously, he does do deliverance at the churches that he speaks at. But there are some online deliverances he does as well. He has a small playlist of Zoom deliverances on his channel, with the latest video being from July of 2020. Spirit is there. I command any spirit there to come up right now and manifest. I command any stubborn demon, come up right now and reveal yourself. Come up and reveal yourself, you hiding spirit. Come up. Reveal yourself in Jesus' name. You have no power. I command you to come up and reveal yourself now. What is your name? I'm angry. Anger, come on, let's go. <laughs> Anger, let's go. You have no power. We know you're there. We're not playing with you. We're not going to give up till she's free. So don't waste your time. Let's go. Spirit of anger, come out right now. <laughs> Leave him now in Jesus' name. Go. Every spirit go now. Every spirit go now. Be loosed now. Come out of them now in Jesus' name. 
We just say be loosed in Jesus' name. Be loosed in Jesus' name. Be loosed in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Come out. Come out. Come out. Every foul spirit, come out now. Now, Isaiah seems to realize that people are coming to him specifically for deliverance and tries to deflect that to other people as much as possible. This seems to be why he stopped the Zoom deliverance calls. Now, he leans into the reasoning behind why he leaned into deliverance calls on a recent podcast with Remnant Radio. I'm a revivalist at heart. Um, it was only until August 2020 I started really preaching about deliverance. I think anybody that's online or in the church, it's safe to say deliverance was talked about more in 2021 than ever before. At least every pastor I've been connected with um, has been talking about it, has been asking about it, has been even pastors that don't agree with it, have never really talked about it much, are now disagreeing with it in 2021. So there has been a mainstream when it comes to deliverance at least like what I've seen, like, like never before, you know, let me just give you an example. Um, we added a thousand people in 2021 to our deliverance map. Now, all of the content that Isaiah is putting out pays off in 2020, as well as 2021. He already had 10,000 subs on YouTube by the end of 2020. And when we go into 2021, by February, he has 57,000 subs and hits 100,000 subs on Facebook. This continual growth is due to a couple of different factors. One, he is putting a lot of content out, like we mentioned at the beginning of this video, content that not a lot of people are talking about. And as he mentioned in the previous clip, deliverance ministry is talked about a lot. So he's sort of riding that wave. Now there's two things that he appears on that I think really do give him a bump in 2021. The first is that he appears on something more with Bob Duvall. ...to actually use the gift. Let me just give you a testimony from a few weeks ago. I was preaching at a church out in North Carolina, and I'm on the, on the stage, on the altar, and I said, okay, Lord, I'm by faith, I wanna activate this gift. I wanna see in the spirit, I wanna activate. And all of a sudden, Bob, I'm walking around, looking at people at the altar, oh, just available for what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And all of a sudden, I see a young man kneeling down at the altar like this with his head down, and I see a dark figure over him, like a dark cloud. I knew it was a demon, but it didn't look like you think. So were, okay, were you seeing it, seeing it? I was, or I was like in the natural were you I was seeing something? Seeing, so it was, it was superimposing itself over the natural. Okay. So it was almost like the natural realm and then something over the natural realm. So I knew it was in the spirit, but I knew it was something demonic because it was like a dark cloud. I don't want to say it was like a demon with claws like you'd think. Right. It was a darkness over him, like a dark figure, a dark cloud. So I knew there was a demon. I discerned with the discerning of spirits, saw it in the spirit, discerned it was a demonic spirit over this young man's life. And in case you're wondering, this is not the only time that Isaiah says things like this. There's been other times as well where he describes how he sees demons and what they look like. Can you look into a crowd and see demons on people or over areas? Yes. That's one of the reasons why I don't wear glasses when I preach is because oftentimes I can see demons on people and I start getting downloaded for them when I look at them. Around this exact same time, he appears on Supernatural with Sid Roth. I want to get saved, these high-level witches and warlocks. I was dealing with a girl yesterday that's in big, taught yoga for years. Where are they going to go? So we have to be ready as believers, not just the churches, but all of you watching. We need to be trained and equipped and ready to deal with these demons of these people that are coming out of the occult, that are coming out of Hollywood, that are coming out of New Age, that want deliverance. And our Messiah was the one that introduced deliverance. Both of these appearances happen and have a combined view viewership of 1.2 million views that does attribute to some of the growth on YouTube. If you check his stats during this time, they dramatically jump. Just looking at the data available to the public online, he's roughly gaining 14,000 subscribers per month just on YouTube. And after these interviews in July, his rate increases even more, jumping between 14,000 a month to 40,000 a month between June and July of 2021. This speaks nothing of the fact that he had already hit 100,000 subscribers back in April of this same year. These are just additional subscribers from all of the viewership on YouTube, as well as Sid Roth's programs. Now, around this same time, Isaiah does something that is reminiscent of what he did back in 2014. After going on Sid Roth's network, he decides to do a commercial spot for Sid Roth with exclusive teachings about demon and demon possession and casting demons out of individuals. It's exclusive for our It's Supernatural audience. Yours for a donation of $29. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 3687. 
you will walk in the divine power of God, you'll walk in the supernatural, and it will become normal for you to see demons cast out. It will become normal for you to see the sick healed. It will become normal for you to see someone die and say, I'm going to go pray and believe God to raise them from the dead. This is the first time, as far as I can tell, that Isaiah has sold anything since he started selling the sermon packs for $20 back in 2014. Now, at the end of the same year, Isaiah partners with Jeremiah Johnson and his organization, The Altar Global, to sell an e-course on spiritual warfare. The course isn't available any longer, but the internet archives show that it sold for $39.99 at the time, and the course covered a lot of the same things that the course for Sid Roth seems to cover. Things like why deliverance is for everyone, ways to ensure success in deliverance, 10 practical ways to cast out demons, 9 reasons those demons may not leave, and how to shut the gates of hell. And it also comes with a free deliverance that Isaiah will pray over you. It's unclear how much Isaiah gets paid or is getting paid at all for these. And while this is not incredibly important, it is interesting to know that Isaiah's ministry is not a nonprofit. He said before that he is not a 501c3. Are you a 5013c? No, I'm not. So there's no way to know how much he's getting for these courses or how much he's making in general. And not that that's important, but that is a totally different approach than we've had in the past. With the Awakening, it was a nonprofit organization. And most ministries are nonprofit organizations as well. But clearly now, that's not the case. Now, along with these infomercials and e-courses, 2021 also brings a very interesting backlash for Isaiah as well. He's been going hard since 2020 on deliverance, and the subject of Christians and demon possession continually comes up and causes quite a bit of issue for Isaiah. A lot of online critics criticize his use of the term possession or even the idea that Christians can be demonized if they're not possessed. Isaiah tries to make a video of this going through the details of this and is even hosted by Ruslan on his podcast early on to try to work through what he means by this. Now, the way you described it was a Christian can deal with demonization, yeah. but the spirit of a Christian is yeah. filled with the Holy Spirit of God. So you could yeah. have demonization on your flesh. You could have demonization attached to your soul or maybe your emotions. I don't know if that's a fair interchangeable yeah. way of that. But the spirit of the Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Because the Holy Ghost dwells in us, we cannot have a demon in our spirit, but we can yeah. have demonization or deal with demonic um, tension. Dem dem I, I don't, I, I don't want to use the word oppression because I feel like that's a cop-out, right? But we can yeah. deal with demonization. Do, do you want to elaborate on this? This is what they say. They say Christians could be oppressed, but not possessed. But here's what I want to say. There's no difference in the Bible. There's right. no difference in the New Testament when it comes to demons. Jesus never distinguishes and neither should we. So I teach people this: stop saying possessed, remove it out of your vocabulary and oppressed um, because this is why the church is so confused. Now, here's what happened when they translated the King James into English from the Greek, the Greek word daimonizomai, which is translated from Greek to English. The English translation is possessed with devils. The actual Greek word means to be under the power of a demon has nothing to do with ownership now let me set the record straight can a christian be possessed no they can't because possessed means ownership okay Come let me on. just set the record for all of you they cannot the devil cannot own you you can have demons listen to what i'm about to say die and go to heaven because your demons are not going to go with you um this is the same thing of people that i deal with in high level occultism that say i sold my soul to the devil you cannot sell your soul to the devil you don't own your soul and the devil doesn't own your soul. You can't sell something you don't own belongs to God. So there's no such thing as selling your soul to the devil. Um, there's also no such thing as a Christian being possessed because the devil doesn't own believers. He can't own a believer. But let me just give you, I'm a shotgun, bunch of verses to you that give biblical evidence that a Christian could be under the power, not possessed, but under the power of a demon. Mark 1 39, Jesus went from synagogue to synagogue, casting out demons. Matthew 16, Jesus told Peter, Satan, get behind me, not speaking to Peter. John 13, the Bible says Satan entered Judas. But here's, a, here's one, Acts chapter five. I'm gonna give you a word for word, okay? And you guys can take it, whatever you wanna take it. Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled your heart yeah. to lie to the Holy Ghost let's, and let's, keep can, back. Can, okay. you, can you stop there? I know, I know you're in a flow. I know yeah, you're in a flow. Yeah, yeah, but ahead, but, but that that passage, when you when you draw when you broke that down on the video, and this is a relatively new video you just you just covered. When you broke yeah. down that passage, because a lot of the fo uh, folks are gonna say this is before the resurrection, this is before the Holy Spirit came. But when you shared that passage, I was like, man. That is the strongest argument right there uh, in the New Testament, in the Acts, in the Church of Acts, where you see someone that's 
Spirit apparently filled. a Christian. Yeah, apparently yeah. spirit-filled, apparently a Christian, and 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 is accused of having uh, demonization in that moment. Oh, he believes Christians can have demons. So mm -hmm. that's the biggest number one thing. And I put my position out there very clear. Mm -hmm. Christians can have demons. No, they can't be possessed. So it's always just the same same thing. He said yeah. this, and that's not what he meant. He said this, and I'm just like, okay, well, yeah. I, I teach basically the Bible or the New Testament doesn't definitively say whether someone's oppressed or possessed. It's a, it's a, like a, a English translation. Demonized, so uh, I always say it's demonized is the king is the um, original Greek, which yep. it, you know is a poor translation when you take demonized to possess with devils. Like I, I teach Christians can't be possessed, but I also teach possession is a English word that was not found in the original Greek. Now, aside from the flack that Isaiah gets for talking about Christians being able to be demonized, he gets in quite a bit of hot water for stating that signs must accompany the gospel presentation. In fact, he says this outright on a few different podcasts that he hosts or content that he makes. And while he tries to explain that even if those things didn't happen, he would still believe, other things he says contradicts that very statement. Is it fair to say that some of your experience drove some of your methodology of ministry? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think every every single person that says that experience doesn't matter is lying to themselves. Mm -hmm. Every single person is shaped and dictated by experiences they go through in life. Yeah. To say like, oh, experience doesn't matter. Now, when it comes to theology and how we look at the word, of course, I love what Dr. Brown says. Dr. Brown says, if I prayed for a thousand people and not one of them got healed, mm -hmm. I would still believe that God's a healer because mm -hmm. the word of God says it. I, I will never base my theology off of experience, but experience definitely has to do with your methodology, mm -hmm. how you preach. But when it comes to like the, like real theology, like Dr. Brown says, my theology is not based on experience. Mm -hmm. My experiences are because of what the word of God says. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys say, well, you really need to cut up the word to get mm -hmm. it to say that. Sure, no, sure, sure, you sure. need to get cut up the word to not to not see deliverance, yeah. to not see miracles. Yeah. Like you got to really stretch to yeah, not well, believe this stuff happens today. I In the Bible, Jesus said, the signs and wonders validate the message is true. They validate the sermon, the preaching that is the true gospel. And John 10, Jesus said, if you don't believe me, believe the miracles. And so that's why anyone that is one, oh, this or that about me or about you or about Daniel Adams or about any of the people that we have on, any of the people we run with and we all kind of are going in that same lane, I'm going like, we have this evidence of God moving, of the power of God Meanwhile, the, these religious people, they have nothing but arguments like and the person with experience is never at the mercy of someone with an argument. And so we we're believing tonight, guys, that there is going to be an experience in your life that you're not going to go to the school of this or school of that. You're going to go to the school of experience because God really wants to touch your life tonight. God really wants to change you tonight. God really wants to bring breakthrough um, in your life tonight. And so I love it. The deliverances, you know. I, I see it like this as long, especially with your testimony. Mine is we didn't, I didn't ask to cast out devils. I didn't ask to, yeah. I want to make someone manifest. I saw that there was a yeah. need and I'm like, I'm going to fill the need. I'm going to be the person there. And by default, it became people come, people get delivered, people get healed. And sadly, I really feel that there's a change coming to the body of Christ where it's going to be more abnormal to not do deliverance than to do deliverance. So it's no longer going to be, oh, you're weird. You do deliverance. It's going to be, you're weird. You don't do deliverance. Yes. Like you guys don't cast out devils. You guys don't heal the sick. Like how do you guys prove the gospel? If Jesus healed the sick and cast out demons literally everywhere he went. Why don't you think as a follower of his, you shouldn't be doing that? Why is it okay for so many pastors to not perform signs and wonders? Why is it okay for pastors to preach against miracles today? It's time to let the Holy Spirit empower our lives and begin to perform signs and wonders so that we can fully present the gospel. There's no getting around it. Without signs and wonders, we have not fully presented the gospel and the signs and wonders are the convincing element. I just find it so hard to convince people God's alive and well. I don't, I literally don't find it hard. When they see deliverance, when they see miracles, when they get healed, when God moves in their life, they're convinced that God is real. But if you don't have miracles, there's no convincing factor. So that's the scary part about powerless Christianity that is propagated in America, is you lose the convincing factor. And guess what? Your cute little play once a year is not gonna convince the world God's alive. Both of these issues, along with a number of others, come up time and time again in videos of people critiquing Isaiah. Videos of people that he would simply call heresy hunters. They go after his theology and what he teaches. However, the growth doesn't stop for Isaiah. 2022 brings much of the same in regards to growth. 
Isaiah's ministry is primarily online now. He does occasionally speak at other churches, but a majority of his time is spent online. You can take a look at a lot of his previous videos. And one of the things that does often get overlooked is that Isaiah has gone through a number of books of the Bible, verse by verse, teaching through them. The book of Colossians, the book of Philippians, the book of Ephesians, the book of Romans, just to name a few. And oftentimes nobody talks about these. Along with this, he continues the Q&As that he started at the very beginning of launching his channel, as well as a podcast called Let's Talk Supernatural. All of this has left him quite busy, and very rarely does he take speaking engagements. Fill out a booking form on our website. Pray, I'll pray about it, but I'll just be honest. The chances are slim. I'm only traveling once a month, and uh, I used to travel pretty much every weekend, and I'm not doing that anymore, so it's not easy to get me to come. It would have to really be God speak to me, but I do pray over every request. So fill out a request on the website to start, and then we can go from there. His YouTube channel continues to grow by an average of 30000 a month, with one huge spike in November of 2020. Now, I don't know what causes this spike, but I do know it is this month that he finally hits 500,000 subscribers. That's 400,000 subscribers in just two years. And the growth of subscribers and his views say basically the same, right under 5 million a month. Now, the reason that this is important is because this kind of growth does not go unnoticed. Isaiah, before, was very much relegated to who he could get to within the churches, who knew his name, where he was speaking, and the regions in which he spoke. But this is an entirely different ballgame. In fact, if you know of Isaiah Saldivar at all, it is likely because you came to know of him anywhere between 2020 and 2022. And the things he's known for over these years, the videos that he makes, are the same things he's known for in 2023. The growth on YouTube in 2020, as well as other social media platforms, basically establishes Isaiah as a primarily online ministry. The skyrocketing growth online seems to lead to Isaiah and his team to expand out his studio so that they can now host guests and have more professional looking setups. And we're super excited about the new studio. If you guys don't know the story, we like, I think the end of December, we decided we wanted to build a studio for this next year and literally everything happened so fast. We were going to do a GoFundMe, but somebody heard we were going to do a GoFundMe before we launched it, while emailed we us. Yeah. While we were talking about it, they emailed us and we're like, God told us to pay for it. So they ended up sending us $30,000 paid for tons of the equipment, all the cameras, all the lights. And then it ended up being total like 60 to 70,000, which I'll make a video all about that. And so they tremendously blessed us with everything that they put into the studio and things like that. So it's going to be really, really good. Spending upwards of sixty to $70,000 on a new studio, $30,000 of which came from an anonymous donor, Isaiah and his team basically built out the manifestation of what he had already begun to do when he launched his channel back in 2020. Now, instead of Zoom interviews, the Revival Lifestyle podcast is now a Joe Rogan-level quality production with high-quality video production and live streaming capabilities. And there are also two other major events Isaiah participates in. Isaiah has been a part of two separate movies on deliverance and revival, both the things that Isaiah champions on his YouTube channel. The first is Come Out in Jesus' Name, and it was released March 13th of 2023. And Isaiah seems to get a bump of subs from this movie release as well, just as he did before with his TV appearances. The second movie that he is a part of is the Domino Revival, which was released in October 23rd of 2023. And as before, seems to get a bump in subscriptions on YouTube because of it. And that brings us up to now. There's no question that Isaiah Saldivar has an enormous influence online, an influence that he developed and grew over time in actual ministry. His influence has only grown and continues to grow as he does different events with the other demon slayers, but within the growing movement of deliverance and the questions that come with it. Isaiah seems to have answers to the issues that now plague the world. Why are so many people addicted? Why are so many people anxious? Why are so many people concerned and worried and scared? Well, Isaiah and the other demon slayers seem to have the answer to this question. That answer is that you are very likely demonized. So the question we have to ask ourselves is this, is Isaiah Saldivar a faithful minister of the gospel? 
Is what he teaches in line with scripture? Does he contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints? Holding fast to the virgin birth, Jesus' perfect life lived, his death in our place for our sins, the bodily resurrection, his ascension into heaven, and his coming again to judge the living and the dead. The only thing we can do currently is watch Isaiah's ministry, and as the Bereans did to Paul in Acts, compare what he says against the scriptures, and to pray for him, that he knows the gospel and he proclaims it to the best of his ability for the glory of God and the growth of his kingdom. And in that moment, I said that, again, an atheist didn't believe, the audible voice of God. We're not talking about a small voice. We're not talking about an inward. The audible voice of God from heaven said, Isaiah, I don't want 99.9% .9 of you. I want everything.